Yo, 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 welcome back to the station, Destination, Devi fam, what's cracking? You know who it is, it's your boy Ray G, joined by my partner in crime, Jordan Richards. You can find me on Twitter, at Ray GQ. Check him out, at your boy J Rich. Make sure you're following the Destination Devi Twitter account, at Destination Devi. We got an Instagram channel, make sure you check that out. Dropping a lot of cool stuff and in a very digestible format that you guys can get on board with over there on Instagram. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if this is your first time here. Welcome, we appreciate you. Got all kinds of shit dropping every single week. From rookie breakdowns, rookie profiles, Debbie stuff, veteran stuff, redraft, bargain bin players, all kinds of stuff. But in this episode today, we're ready to talk about some bounce back players. Who were some of these players that were sort of like, I don't know, had a down season last year. People are a little bit sleeping on them. They're kind of souring on these prospects, but these these players but they're still super talented players that can definitely exceed their expectation uh, in 2020. And I think we're going to see that across the board at a lot of different positions. So uh, we both have a couple of players that we're going to talk about. We'll dive into it, see how he likes them, see how I like his players, talk about what they did last season, their expectations for this upcoming season. We're getting right to it. We're not even beating around the bush. Man, Gus Johnson dropped the intro. You got barbecue back there and you didn't invite me. Kurt Ma- here we go. We are going to kick this off since I'm the host. I am going to go first with my number one bounce back candidate. And it's crazy to see the sort of disrespect for this player who has been one of the most dominant fantasy wide receivers that we've seen in a long time long time in his 2019 season it wasn't like he was absolute shit he still had over a thousand yards receiving and it was one of his lowest statistical seasons of his of his career and I'm talking about Cleveland Browns number one wide receiver OBJ Odell Beckham Jr. This is year two for him in Cleveland with Baker Mayfield we've got a new coach in Cleveland we know about the dysfunction in the history of the Cleveland Browns organization but OBJ Year two, he was dealing with the sports hernia injury last year. So, yes, his numbers took a dip. And, you know, it was pretty damn bad. It was pretty damn bad. And I'll just start with the drops. He led the league in drops, I believe. He was like one or two in drops in the league. Every every efficiency metric that OBJ is known for was like career low statistically across the board. So, it truly could not get any worse for Odell Beckham Jr., and part of that was his fault and his doing, not catching the ball and being injured, but another part of that was Baker Mayfield wasn't very good. A lot of us, once OBJ was traded to Cleveland, expected Baker Mayfield to just make this astronomical leap at the quarterback position with Baker, with Nick Chubb in the backfield. They had Kareem Hunt coming back after week eight, Jarvis Landry, David Njoku. OBJ was supposed to shine. He was supposed to shine, and when you look at his numbers from 2019, I mean, 74 receptions wasn't bad. Bad, 18th in the NFL, but here's where it got kind of gross, right? Uh, well, his targets, 133 targets. I believe that was a career high for Odell Beckham Jr. or right there of what he did in his best season at New York. So that was 12th in the NFL, second in the league in deep targets, but he was 12th in target share in the NFL, but his efficiency metrics really really stunk all the way across the board. Catch rate was low. Yards per target were low. Yards per reception were low. I uh, just didn't do very good. Again, number one in the NFL in drops. So only assuming that Baker Mayfield year two with OBJ takes a step forward. Odell Beckham Jr. more comfortable in Cleveland, more comfortable playing uh, that number one role with Baker Mayfield. I think he is definitely going to exceed his expectations. And when you look at where he's drafted at right now, according to FFPC drafts, he's going about player 40. So he's right there at player 39, being drafted as the 39th player off the board, behind DJ Moore, behind Amari Cooper, behind Kenny Galladay, Mike Evans. Listen, you know... It's 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 probably appropriate based off his production for from last year. But when you're talking about a player who can absolutely smash that ADP and elevate himself into a top five player, top five player at his position once again, Odell Beckham Jr. is somebody that I'm definitely not writing off. He's somebody that I would be willing to make that bet on. Jay, where are you at with OBJ in 2019? 
So I'm kind of with you in a lot of fronts, man. I think that you nailed it on the head. He's definitely a bounce back candidate, someone who deals with a sports hernia injury all season. Um, I've never had a hernia injury, but I know that it is definitely hampering to say the least. Some of these NFL players can really grind it out. But I do agree with a lot of what you're saying. The only real pushback for me is that there is a plethora of weapons there. OBJ should still be the number one wide receiver, but can we expect that spreading the ball type offense to impact his total targets um, that's really my only my only concern because I believe it's Stefanski who's over there now, right? Running the yeah. offense, running that run heavy game. So if you th- assume that he takes that kind of Stefan Diggs role, that role that everyone didn't like in Minnesota, that may be the issue. We may see a rise in yards per reception, but the issue may just be the spreading of the weapons, having the two tight ends, having the two running backs, and then obviously Jarvis Landry assuming that slot role. Not to say he can't do it. That's probably the only concern, but I definitely agree with all the points you made. Yeah, and my only counter to that is he's the alpha in that offense. And, you know, Jarvis Landry is, they, they said he's recovered well from offseason hip surgery, but we've got to see it on the field, right? And with those two tight ends, we look at how those tight ends were used in Minnesota, Irv Smith and Kyle Rudolph. I, I don't know. Now, Austin Hooper, if you don't know, he is the highest paid tight end in the NFL. So I would assume that he would be more involved in the offense. But they need a third, fourth receiver with Cleveland. I mean, I can't – I legitimately cannot name four receivers on the Cleveland Browns. I, I legitimately can't name four, and I watch a shit ton of football. So I think OBJ is in a prime position to recapture that feature wide receiver role, role and, and get his name back in the graces of top five wide receivers in the NFL. If I was going to bank on a player to do it, this season it would be Odell Beckham Jr. But you're up. Who you got as a bounce-back candidate in 2020? Okay, so I'm going with another guy who is repeatedly injured, unfortunately for us, and that is Bengals wide receiver A.J. Green. The Bengals, who didn't have A.J. Green for all of last season, now are stepping into a new role with a new quarterback, um, second year with offensive coordinator Zach Taylor, and a plethora of offensive weapons around the field. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the Bengals situation, they actually had over 600 targets last year, with three of those wide receivers getting 78 or more targets. So you think about A.J. Green, he's definitely going to be a top three option in that offense. And Tyler Boyd, the number one option, actually had 148 targets. So you think about A.J. Green, his talent level, a guy who can average 15 yards of reception. I believe in his career, he averages 14 yards of reception. Now, on top of that, he has a 60% catch rate. And let's say he gets 100 targets of those 600. That's only a 17% target share. And A.J. Green is a dominant alpha wide receiver who we know can command at least 20% of those targets. Now, if he was to get 100 targets, that'd be 60 receptions for about 900 yards at a 15% rate and six touchdowns at his career touchdown rate of 6%, which is good for a wide receiver 33. I think that's a fairly conservative projection for A.J. Green. He's being drafted right around there, right around Michael Gallup. So you think about Michael Gallup, the wide receiver two on Dallas versus the wide receiver one on the likely pass heavy Bengals who improved their offensive line in theory, improve their quarterback play. There should be a lot of upside for A.J. Green, and while there are some small injury concerns, I think you're buying him at a pretty fair price as a potential wide receiver two, wide receiver three, and there's plenty of upside for a guy who's been a wide receiver one multiple times in his career. Yeah, that's not a bad that, – I, I really like that. I think as long as A.J. Green is locked in with what Cincinnati is doing, with what they're building – uh, I think he will outperform his ADP according to FFPC drafts. He's coming off the board as wide receiver 29, the 79th player overall. Some wide receivers right before him, Debo Samuel, T.Y. Hilton, Devontae Parker, being drafted right after him, Marquise Hollywood-Brown, Jarvis Landry, and his teammate Tyler Boyd. So, And like you said, Michael Gallup is right after that. So I definitely think I think that's a good call. I think a lot of people are sleeping on AJ, and part of the problem is, yes, he's been hurt like the past. It feels like three, four years in a row continues to get hurt. But AJ is definitely somebody that can outperform his ADP. And right now, man, I mean, even in dynasty startups, he's going super late. You know what I mean? Like, why not take a flyer on a player? What is AJ Green, like 31? So he's still got time 32. left, man, 32. I mean, he still has a couple of solid years left in him if he can stay on the field and, and put it together. And with Joe Burrow being there, hey, rising tide raises all ships. And that's why I want to talk about – I'm going to combine. I'm going to cheat a little bit and use two players that I want to talk about. Both of them play on the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I'm talking – listen, it's going to sound disgusting. It's going to sound gross. But I'm talking Evan – wait, I was going to say Evan – Eric Ebron, the tight end, the new starting tight end 
of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I couldn't even get his damn name right. That's how gross he was last season. And I'm talking about James Conner, the running back from the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think these two players are prime bounce back candidates. Two years ago, people were talking about James Conner as a top five, top 10 running back in dynasty. You know, you got to have him in redraft. You need him in dynasty. And now it's like, I don't even want anything to do with him. They drafted his replacement in Anthony McFarlane. You know, he, the, the problem, it, it's funny because AJ Green and James Conner have the same sort of concern. It's their ability to stay on the field. James Conner is a very physical, physical running back, menacing type presence, and he's susceptible to a lot of injuries. We saw him banged up quite a bit last season, didn't do as well last year, but the Pittsburgh Steelers were a mess all the way around. I think Ben was hurt week one, week one or week two, and after that, it was just downhill. Devlin Hodges, Mason Rudolph, and I don't even know who else they had back there at quarterback, but with big Ben Roethlisberger back, that, listen, he I, he's unathletic, he's fat, he's big, uh, he's just looks like shit, but he can sling the rock. And if Ben is healthy, if that elbow is healthy, that is going to help that entire team, and that is going to help James Conner. And I do think having competent running backs behind James Conner will also help him. And Anthony McFarlane, completely different than the other running backs on that team, providing some of that explosion. You've got Benny Snell as a competent backup. Maybe James Conner doesn't see the same type of workload as he did the year he replaced Le'Veon Bell when Le'Veon Bell held, held out. But he could be efficient with those touches when they get to the goal line. He's probably going to be the goal line back. I'm not concerned about Jalen Samuels. He's probably going to be the pass-catching running back in that offense as well, as Anthony McFarlane really did not demonstrate that at the University of Maryland. So when you're talking about a bounce-back candidate, I think James Conner is prime for one. And Eric Ebron, once again, he's a starting tight end for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And we know that Ben when he had Heath Miller, and Heath Miller was the epitome of catch and fall down, but Heath Miller was racking up freaking targets. And, you know, Eric Ebron is still 27 years old. He's still very young, ultra athletic. He didn't do jack shit last year, but the year before that with Indianapolis, he was a Pro Bowl caliber tight end. Now, granted, he had like 100 fucking touchdowns that season, and we're not going to expect him to catch 10 plus touchdowns, but he's an athletic tight end in that Pittsburgh offense where they're sort of still uncertain at the wide receiver position. I know you've got Juju and Deontay Johnson. They drafted Chase Claypool. You've got James Washington, but they need a person that's going to be able to stretch the seams, and Eric Ebron can do that. He's going to be the most athletic tight end that Ben Roethlisberger has ever played with, so why not take a shot on a guy who's being drafted after, like, everybody? I mean, nobody wants Eric Ebron whatsoever. Let's let's just take a look here. Eric Ebron, according to FFPC drafts, is coming off of the board is tight end 21, the 134th player overall. Tight ends right in front of him. Ian Thomas. You've got Jack Doyle, Blake Jarwin. Tight ends right after him. Chris Herndon. Yeah. You know, I, I, listen, we've seen him produce. We've seen him be productive. Yes, you're going to have to struggle with the drops here and there. But Eric Ebron in that Pittsburgh offense with Ben Brothersberger, who Pittsburgh Steelers threw the ball like with Ben back there the year before. I think the most times in the NFL, they're going to chunk it around a ton this year. So those are two bounce back candidates for me. Eric Ebron, James Conner, your thoughts on those two players, Jay? Uh, so I'm a big fan of your James Conner pick. He's actually someone that I almost added to my list. Um, but as you said, the issue is injuries. There is still we'll say competent guys behind him. We have, we don't love Benny Snell. We don't love Jalen Samuels. We don't love Anthony McFarland. Maybe some people do, but at the end of the day, we love the Pittsburgh running back position. Whoever runs for the Pittsburgh Steelers produces, produces yards, pr produces receptions, produces touchdowns. And to your point about the goal line work, Connor will definitely get that work. There's no way they're going to give it to Snell. There's no way they're going to give it to Samuels. The only fear, as you said, is maybe Eric Ebron being that athletic tight end gets catches some of those touchdowns because they're going to have that weapon in the offense. Vance McDonald, another threat, who's just a big body. Other than Chase Claypool, they don't really have a guy who's 6'3", 6'4", on that offense to catch pass in the red zone and so i definitely like that ebron pick the issue of course that we don't know is just volume um, but as you mentioned you know the steelers threw the ball i believe 696 times in 2018 so um i mean 
I, I love it. I love the picks. And that's why my pick um, is the last guy on that list that you talk, touched on. It's Juju Smith-Schuster. You fucking stole uh, him Juju, from me. I wanted to talk about Juju. I, I know. You I know. I know. I know. Yes. I know. I know. Okay. But I know I did more research than you. So let me just let me just give you some stats on Juju real quick. Now, first, of course, wide receiver 12 right now in drafts. That's the real issue. That's my only issue with Juju. He's still very highly priced. He's also young, 23 years old. He has lots of gas left in the tank, and he has plenty of room to ascend. Of course, we de- we talked about the quarterback situation last year. Terrible. Targets were down. Receptions were down. Catch percentage was down. Literally everything went downhill for Juju on top of having injuries. Now, I want to take a look at his efficiency metrics between his two seasons, where he got 166 targets for 400 yards and seven touchdowns in 2018. Now, last season, he had, I believe, 50 receptions, 700 yards, and three touchdowns. But if we actually compare his statistics year over year on an average basis, he had 7.8 yards per target last season and an 8.59 yards per target in 2018. Now, that was due to a decrease in catch percentage of 7%. His touchdown rate in 2019 was 4.28%, and his touchdown rate in 2018 18 was 4.21 percent so a nearly identical touchdown percentage for juju smith schuster now of course big ben coming back last season he had a 60 percent catch rate with big ben he has a 70 percent catch rate now of course all these metrics tell you that he is much better with big ben so what we're assuming big ben's going to come back they're going to throw the ball early and often because they're not afraid to lean on big ben instead of that run game and then if we were to talk about juju getting targets it's just going to come down to how much volume do we believe he can get Right now, he's wide receiver 12. He's going behind the Mike Evans. You're talking about the Amari Cooper range. Those guys that are still highly priced, but the targets are in question. Juju, I think, is one of those guys that maybe you see 130 targets, but I don't think 150 targets is out of the realm of possibilities. If he does somehow get to that 150 target mark, that's 105 receptions, 1,440 yards, and those seven touchdowns, which would be good for... 290 fantasy points and wide receiver two last season yeah well i mean that's kind of what we expected from him last year a lot of people had him up there as a top three wide receiver in 2019 you know with mt with new hopkins it was juju smith schuster right there up there at the top so while that those numbers seem lofty i i don't think that's really out if if ben's there for the entire season he's going to see 130 targets the volume will be there We've, we still need to see if he's going to be able to be efficient. And the question has always been, was Juju Smith-Schuster really that good or was he a product of playing across from a Hall of Fame wide receiver in Antonio Brown? And say what you want about A.B. and his antics, he's a Hall of Fame caliber wide receiver. Now, one thing you didn't mention is of the receiving yards, I believe Juju Smith-Schuster is only behind Josh Gordon and Randy Moss for the most receiving yards up to this point in their career at the age that he is, which is insane that that's how good he's been since he stepped on an NFL field. And that's despite playing, what, 12 games in 2019. And I don't even know if he was really playing for 12 games yeah, he because he just healthy for a few yeah he wasn't healthy uh last season so uh, although his adp is still quite high i definitely think he's one of those players where as especially in dynasty we've sort of discounted juju he's still a top dynasty asset at the wide receiver he's 23 years old he's still a kid he's still learning he had one season with ben well two seasons with ben a, a season with with nothing Hodges and Rudolph now he gets Big Ben back and he's going to be the number one target in that offense so I like it so the last player I want to talk about and at this point we're just talking about all Pittsburgh Steelers or former Pittsburgh Steelers but I want to talk about Le'Veon Bell I am very excited for Lev Bell in 2020 and part of that is the growth of Sam Darnold him getting better, they, them finding him weapons. They bring in Bashar Perryman. They still have Jamison Crowder. Hopefully we get Chris Herndon back healthy, and they drafted Denzel Mims in the second round to have competent wide receivers surrounding their quarterback. What they also did, which was a fantastic move by the Jets, and we don't say that often, but drafting Makai Becton, the big offensive tackle, in the first round was huge for the Jets. That helps Sam Darnold out, and that helps Le'Veon Bell out. When you look at Le'Veon Bell's stats from last season, right, his snap share, 87%, fourth in the NFL. Opportunity share, 76%, seventh in the NFL. 11th in carries, seventh in targets. I mean, the volume 
was there for Le'Veon Bell, but the efficiency just didn't happen. He was 23rd in the league in rushing yards. He was 7th in receptions, 9th in receiving yards, so he had that. And here's the real kill part, the kicker. Four touchdowns. All of that opportunity, all of that volume, he only had four touchdowns. So if we can just, if, if, if the mean will regress, some positive touchdown regression for Le'Veon Bell, Oh my gosh, with that type of volume, they drafted LaMichael P. Ryan in the third or fourth round. He's a backup. They brought in Frank Gore. He's a backup. Le'Veon Bell, this may be his last season in New York, and they are going to wear his ass out. He is going to get the ball early, often, and he looked good behind a horrible offensive line, behind uh, inside of a horrible Jets team with no pass catchers of consequence. He was out there, and he was playing his ass off. So say what you want about Lev Bell. I don't think he's slowing down anytime soon, and he should exceed his ADP expectations, which he's still being drafted as a top 40 player. According to FFPC, he's still going as a top 40 player. He's coming off of the board as RB19. Yeah, I mean, I mean, when, you, when you're talking about this season in 2020, I'm not taking Jonathan Taylor over Le'Veon Bell for in seasonal leagues. I, I'm not doing that. There, there's no way I'm taking JT over Lev Bell. Um, I, I think Bell is going to smash. At least volume is king. He's going to have every opportunity to perform this year. And I think with his skill set in an improved offense, with a better offensive line, we should see a definite bounce back from Le'Veon Bell and him eclipsing that 1,000-yard mark while still catching and receiving over 350 receiving yards pushing him back up into that RB, back in RB1 range for 2020. What are your thoughts on Lev Bell? Oh, uh, man, you picked another good guy, a guy who I've been, uh, I was looking at as one of my potential running backs. And it's like you said, it's just volume, man. And, and everything that they've done to try and improve that team, I think it all bodes well for Le'Veon Bell. I don't think it's much different when you talk about the Pittsburgh Steelers. Having a more adept passing game will open up those run lanes. Improving your offensive line will open up the run lanes. Having Sam Darnold another year in the system will open up the run lanes. And you won't be able to stack so much against Le'Veon Bell. And I think that's another reason why he could definitely smash if he has that same target share, which I expect because there isn't established receivers there. Him and Sam Darnold have some of the best report on that offense other than maybe Sam and Jay Cr and Jamison Crowder. So you think about it from that standpoint, an improved offensive line, a better passing game, a slightly more efficient Le'Veon Bell, and uh, frankly, a guy who I think is a little bit pissed off, you know, he had a really bad season last year. And we know Lev Bell, he's not a guy who takes these things lightly. People talking shit about him, he's going to get pissed off. He's going to train hard. He's going to work hard. He's going to try and prove these doubters wrong. And I think that Lev Bell is a guy who could really have a good season, and he's not being overdrafted right now. I'd say, you know, there is some downside playing on the Jets, but I think there's still plenty of upside for him to bounce back and potentially be, you know, a top 14, 15 running back fairly easily. I think I think he's I think he can push with that type of volume. If if you just add four more touchdowns onto that to give him eight TDs. I think there's a realistic possibility we see Lev Bell as a top 12 running back this season. I, I really believe that. And you're right. He is pissed off. He doesn't take – did you see the uh, fantasy football counselor challenging him to a – Oh, yeah. <laughs> to a – Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's great. pissed off, man. Yeah, man, he's pissed. He's, he's ready to smash, off. man. I like Bell as a bounce-back candidate here in 2020. What do you think about him for Dynasty, though? He's, what, 28 going on 29 years old? Uh, where are you at with him for, for in Dynasty Leagues? Yeah, 28 and a half. So next he'll play this season at age 28, and next year he'll be 29 years old. Where are you at with him in Dynasty? I know you're, you you buy Bell quite a bit in Dynasty, don't you? I've been thinking about it for sure. Um, pretty much every draft I've been in, especially recently, you see him go in the 7th, 8th round, and that's still super flex league, so you may see him go in the 6th round in a traditional one-quarterback league. Um, but for a guy who can easily be an RB2 with that volume, I don't see a reason why – teams aren't trying to win by taking a Le'Veon Bell. I tweeted this out yesterday talking about how Leno Fournette is kind of the same value, but I think he's just a little bit better of a player, right? But why are dynasty owners just simply passing on these guys at better value when their redraft ADP is higher than that? And so what you just, you're going to say, ah, I'd rather take a younger guy win later than try and win your first year. I, I just don't get it. And Le'Veon Bell is a perfect example of that, of a guy who is getting drafted in the 7th, 8th round at times in Dynasty startups, who could easily be your your running back, sorry, 3 on your team. 
You know, I have a team where I drafted Dalvin Cook and Leonard Fournette. If I drafted Le'Veon Bell as my RB3, I'm probably coming out ahead because he's an easy RB2 floor. Now, again, it's a rental. It's a one-year type of thing, guaranteed. But if you want to win, these are the kind of moves you have to make in Dynasty and even in Redraft, taking these guys with high floors and still have good upside, like we talked about with James Conner. Same type of situation. Yeah, I think in seasonal leagues, he's a smash. In redraft leagues, Le'Veon Bell is a smash. He he will probably outproduce his ADP. In Dynasty, would you rather have Le'Veon Bell or David Montgomery? So, the issue with David Montgomery is, and, and I kind of mentioned this to you before, is that I think he's still kind of riding off that PFF force miss tackle grade that he got two years ago now playing at Iowa State. Now, we talk about, sorry, and Le'Veon Bell, who's been an RB1, for numerous seasons, right? And so, so okay. Why are we who would you take? Who would you take? Le'Veon Bell or David Dan Montgomery? Le'Veon Bell. Le'Veon Bell, without question. Uh, he's got a higher floor, and I think he's just a better asset for that team. You know, Allen Robinson's number one asset on the Bears, and Le'Veon Bell is number one asset on the Jets. Yeah, I, man, I'm, I'm not even a po. I think he's still got some. I, th- my issue with Bell is I think Bell could be like, after this, fuck it, I'm just going to go rap or do whatever, and I'm done with the NFL. But I still think he's got – I think he still has some good seasons left. So I'm with you with, with people overlooking him, him probably outproducing his ADP, especially in redraft, and still as your RB3 in Dynasty. And this just speaks to a bigger issue, Jay. Look how quick shit changes for the running back position, man. It seems like just yesterday it was Le'Veon Bell – top 15 pick in dynasty startup drafts and now we're talking about him as running back three it just makes me it terrifies me with some of these backs I know we talk about Fournette and Joe Mixon but man at what point it's like once they once they hit the cliff and start to decline it happens fast for the running back position and yes that can create value later down the line but I'm thinking about and I know this sounds crazy Zeke Elliott. I'm thinking about players like Chris Carson. I'm starting to think about Nick Chubb. I'm starting to think about, okay, when do these guys fall off from being what it literally seems like just yesterday, Le'Veon Bell was smashing and he was a no-brainer, the running back one in football. And now look at it, man. One missed season, a season with the Jets, and now he's an RB3. I I don't know, maybe this is a different topic for a different day, but if you have any thoughts on it, it's just concerning with the running backs how quickly stuff changes, man. Well, to your point, and one thing that I would just mention is that I remember his last season in Pittsburgh, he's going to be the workhorse, they're going to run him to the ground, one oh one, and he held out, and fantasy owners got nothing from him, and ever since, he's been basically a falling asset, Right. And this is a guy who would have been, what, 26 at the time? You know, not quite falling off the cliff yet, but definitely maybe over the hill. But you talk about a guy who was the 101. So in two years, is Christian McCaffrey going to be worth a seventh-round pick in Dynasty? Yeah. We hope not. We hope yeah. not. And and I'm not trying to say that he will be, but yeah. that is literally how far Le'Veon Bell has fallen in two yeah. off-seasons. Yeah, people were still taking him, even with the threat of the holdout. They were like, he's going to come back. I'm taking him one-on-one, literally. People were taking him one on It was like A.B. or the question was A.B. or Le'Veon Bell, who do you take? And a lot of people were picking Le'Veon Bell, thinking he was going to play, and then he didn't. I don't know. It's, we'll get into that later, but just kind of scary, man. Go ahead and give us uh, another breakout candidate for you in 2020. Okay, my last breakout candidate is more of a buy low. It's kind of a little bit of a sneaky two-in-one. And so basically what I'm doing is I'm going after the Seattle tight end. And the reason for that is because you look at what Will Disley did last year. And Will Disley is kind of like that two, that second target. You have Will Disley, and then they brought in Greg Olson. People need to remember that Disley, while he only played six games, he averaged 12.3 points per game last season with Russell Wilson. That was good for tight end nine overall in the league. Now, we're always looking for these sneaky tight end ones. How about a guy who is now currently ranked at tight end 30 plus and is coming back off of ACL surgery? Yes, for sure. But they also signed a guy who's completely healthy in Greg Olson. And Greg Olson has had his injuries in the past. He's a little bit older. But if he's going to be that red zone threat, and I know these DK truthers are starting to get a little nervous. They're starting to get a little nervous. Will Disley had four touchdowns in six games last season. Greg Olson, I believe, only had three touchdowns last season. But 
these are guys that are going in the 20 plus 30 plus rounds of ADP. These guys are going completely undrafted and redraft. And I think that, you know, this whole, this whole idea of let Russ cook and DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett and maybe Josh Gordon and Chris Carson coming back. I just think that when it comes down to it, they're going to need another red zone option. They're going to need a tight end that Russ can just throw the ball up to, whether it's Greg Olson, whether it's Will Disley. If you can maybe pair them up or pick one, I would probably pick Disley based on the age. But Olsen could be a guy who sneaks into, you know, 80 targets and double-digit touchdowns if everything goes right for him. And to me, it's like, why wouldn't I buy a tight end who has that kind of upside? Who And we saw it in that offense with Disley. And we've seen it in the past where Russ just, and even I think it's Jacob Hollister had a stretch where he was a fantastic, a fantastic tight end as well. And so you just see that Russ kind of wants to have that consistent option at tight end. And if you can nail that this offseason, whether you're in Dynasty or Redraft, I think you're going to be rewarded this year. Yeah, that's not a bad call, man. It's it's gross. It's gross because I think Disley has been hurt like back-to-back seasons. Uh, Olsen, mad old, but one of those guys, they're going to be the red zone weapon. They're going to be one of the primary red zone weapons for Russell Wilson, and you're playing with a Hall of Fame quarterback. So um, if it were me, I would probably take Disley in redraft and in Dynasty for sure. There's no doubt in Dynasty you take Will Disley, regardless if he was hurt or not. Greg Olson is probably his final hoorah, and then he's done. But I'd probably take Disley in redraft uh, this season, and if he's healthy, Listen, man, he's a big athletic tight end. I know he's been hurt a lot, but, you know, we can't we can't draft based on, uh, I think he's going to get hurt. I mean, anybody could get hurt at any time. So I don't hate that. A couple of more players that I just want to toss out there, uh, Jay, uh, we kind of talked about it offline. I think Marvin Jones is primed for a bounce-back season. It's funny, I didn't realize how damn good Marvin Jones has been until I went back and started to look at his stats, and I was like, this dude is really Really good. And playing across from Kenny Galladay, you've got TJ Hawkinson there, an improved running back in DeAndre Swift. And I, I know you're a big fan of Matthew Stafford. Stafford was balling before he got hurt last year, and I mean balling. So you get him back, uh, Marvin Jones back healthy. Listen, I think he's sneaky value in redraft and still in dynasty. I st- I'm still all about some Marvin Jones, man. Yeah, I'm totally with you. I know I, I finally I finally did it. I convinced you that Marvin you Jones did. is a quality asset. You did. And I remember when we were doing that uh, that redraft show, I was like, we got to take Marvin Jones here. He's a value, and, and he's a guy who I've had on a couple of teams even last season. But the thing with Marvin Jones is like you can talk about, oh, he had a four-touchdown game, you know, whatever. But this dude can go up and get Get a yeah, touchdown on any play over any corner. It doesn't matter who yeah. it is. It doesn't matter how athletic they are. Marvin Jones can get that done. Now, if I'm going to add to this, and I'm going to, and and the other guy who we've talked about before is Evan Ingram. Evan Ingram was tight end seven in points per game last season. He could easily be the number one target for Daniel Jones, and I think he's a sneaky guy who's being severely discounted because of that injury history, and I totally understand why. But if you're in a draft where he's going in the double-digit rounds, that's a shot worth taking because, like we said, you know, you can get an Eric Ebron probably off waivers, a Will Disley off waivers. Taking a shot on a guy with tremendous upside who was a first-round pick, I believe, only three years ago, Yes, he's had that injury concern, but when he's on the field, he produces. And so if you pair him with another safer tight end, Evan Ingram is a stud of a player. He commands targets, and he is a great wide receiver tight end, move tight end, whatever you want to call him. But he's going to get those targets from Daniel Jones week after week. And there you go. So bounce back players for the 2020 season. For me, Odell Beckham Jr., James Conner and Eric Ebron and then Le'Veon Bell and then sprinkle of Marvin Jones in there. And then for you, Jay, your bounce back candidates, Juju Smith-Schuster. Uh, who the hell else did you have? Who was after Juju? I don't even know. AJ Green. AJ Green. AJ <laughs> Green. And the Will Seattle Disney Titans. And Evan yes. Ingram. Seattle and Evan ends, Ingram. Yes. There you go. There you go. That is it. That is the show. It is a wrap. This is Destination Devi. I am Ray GQ. That is my boy at your boy Jay Richards on Twitter. Hey, if you like the content, subscribe to the channel. 
Hey, if you go over to FTM Fantasy, make sure you smash promo code all gas. A L L G A S. Gas me up, baby. Get you a discount at the checkout. I think it's like 5% right now. If you like what we're doing here, if you want to support the movement, we would appreciate it. If you go to patreon.com forward slash all gas, join the squad, the all gas army. Best damn Debbie Dynasty community in fantasy. But that's it. That's it. I'll be back later this week with the rookie profile on Friday. That's the show, baby. We're out. Deuces.